thank you so much for being here today and being a part of worship where we get to experience and watch people who are declaring who they belong to. What a beautiful thing that is. I cannot get over, ever get over what God has done for me when I see what God has done for others. And you know, if you're a part of this church, a part of First Baptist Simpsonville Upstate Church, you are, uh, you're on the team. Uh, we are part of a team. This is not just a bunch of ministers doing things. You're part of a team where you've got, uh, you are part of uh, the work and part of the joy and part of the worship where we get to enjoy the fruits of what God has done. And uh, it's wonderful to see and it, and it trickles down all the way. And I know that Pastor Wayne and Miss Amy don't, uh, they, he tries to decentralize himself so that it gives, um, it gives the perspective of our vision and not him. But I would say that I really appreciate uh, Pastor Wayne and Miss Amy and their heart. And it is called, and I'm pastor for 20 years. And there's one thing that a pastor can do, and that is get prideful. And, uh, but one thing that we know that uh, Pastor Wayne is, is not prideful. And so it trickles down to all of us. And for us to understand this, it's about the kingdom of God. And it's about getting the kingdom of God to the upstate so that people would know him and that 25 people would be baptized through all of the campuses. It's wonderful. And it, it displays one major point, And that is the faithfulness of God. You see, we are not who we are and God's, and things aren't happening the way they are without God being faithful to his word and his work. So we look at Revelation and we're going to be in Revelation 16, 15 and 16. If you want to get, find an app or your Bible or, or look on the screen, Revelation 15 and 16, we're going to look at the faithfulness of God and not just the faithfulness of God uh, today, <clears throat> but we're going to see the faithfulness of God throughout all of the generations, throughout all of history. We are looking at Revelation and it's, it's, it's an account of future events. Now, when we have been studying Revelation, some of you may still feel this way, but when you come to Revelation and start reading it, it's almost like getting on an elevator. Let me explain. Some books I love to go through. People will say, John's my favorite. The first John's my favorite. Uh, Book of Love. I I love James and how we go through it. Then you get to Revelation. It's like standing on an elevator. It's like, well, let's get to the next floor. And it's awkward. And you don't want to talk. And if anybody starts talking, then then that's awkward. And they're weird. Don't start telling stories. That's how we feel about Revelation. We're going to to get there, but let's just get on it and off of it. And that'd that'd be it. But Revelation is so packed full of the beauty and the glory of God. And we have seen that and I appreciate how that this series has really turned out for us to see the plain things. And I'm telling you, the plain things in the book of Revelation really shows us the faithfulness of God. And it shows us the majesty of Jesus. So with all of that introduction, let's read just a little bit of chapter 15 Explain it and then uh, see what God has to say. It says, verse one, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them, the wrath of God is finished. It's like, finally, we've had 21 judgments. Seven of those last judgments are what this chapter 15 and 16 are talking about. And, and if, if you were here last week or if you read chapter 14, you will find that there is a harvest. And so that harvest comes about, an angel swings a sickle and there's a harvest on earth. Well, 15 and 16 kind of give the details of what that harvest looks like. How's it going to happen? But the difference in this passage, in this, this text that we would see about the wrath of God is that it is a celebratory passage. When you're talking about the faithfulness of God and then you're talking about the wrath of God, then you're talking about celebrating something. So what are we celebrating in verse number two? 
God doing damage? I don't know. Let's see. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire and all those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps, with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb. Chapter 14, we see that they are singing a new song, a song that nobody can sing unless you've experienced it. Then in chapter 15, they're singing the song of Moses, a song that was written way, way thousands of years ago. So what is the point of this text? What he is getting at, what John is getting at is, and, and, and the visions that he's seeing, he is seeing that there are people that are singing the songs of Moses when the children of Israel, when Israel was coming out of bondage into the promised land and they began singing songs to God about his faithfulness. So it's telling us that God was faithful in Exodus and then God will be faithful in the end and God is faithful now. It means God's never changed. You see, God was faithful before you ever knew him. God was faithful before you were born. God was faithful. And what I mean is that God will do what he says he will do. He, it will happen. So he's saying the wrath that he's fixing to pour out is singing the songs of Moses about it. It means that if God said in Exodus something would happen and he says in Revelation something will happen, it's going to happen. And so he's talking about his wrath poured out. But when he's talking about it, he's talking about it in a celebratory way. We'll get to that in just a moment. But here's the this, here's this song. I don't know the tune, so I'm just going to read it. <laughs> Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God of the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. This is drawing back to Exodus. And they're singing the song of Exodus and talking about it and saying God was faithful then. God did things then and we can sing the same song thousands of years later. Same song. It doesn't have to change. It's the same song. All right, then in verse number five, there's another correlation to, uh, in this passage to back in Exodus and back in that time. It says, and after this, I looked and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. Now that means the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God. When Moses came out of the out of Egypt, brought them out of Egypt and they were in the desert along the way, God said, I want to talk to you. I really want to talk to you, all of you. And he said, but he said, if I, ha if I come out and I talk to you face to face, you'll die. So he says, I'm going to make a tabernacle, a dwelling place for my presence to dwell so I can talk to you. And so when he made that dwelling place, he made it in such a way that, that the priest and everyone else would have rituals and things that they would do in front of the presence of God. Now, what did all this mean? Everything that he was doing in verse number, looking at verse number five, I saw the sanctuary, the tabernacle of witness in heaven was open. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues in the house of God, in the sanctuary, in the dwelling place of God, there were seven angels with seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen and golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels go, seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. That is drawing back and you can look back in the Old Testament and you can find all of this happening in the Old Testament. And then he's saying it's gonna happen again. But there's something interesting about when you're talking about the temple of God and you're talking about the song of Moses, it also says this, the song of the lamb. And then the song that he sings is giving glory to God, giving glory to God. And it is, it, it is a mirror of what's happening in Revelation in singing the songs to the lamb. 
And then we come to the tabernacle and you wonder, why did they do these rituals? Why did they have the sacrifices? Why did they do these things in the Old Testament? And you would think, well, God's just wanting to give them busy work. Let's just get busy. And I'm, I want you to kill lambs and just get bloody and all that. And that it would be dumb to think it didn't have a point. The point of what was happening in the tabernacle is God's presence came to dwell with humans. And what God had to say through his presence always pointed to Jesus. Always pointed to Jesus. So if you ever wonder what God wants to say, it's going to be Jesus. And when we look at this text, we wonder, we, we, we look at it and we say, okay, the wrath of God is coming out. What is the point of them talking about it coming out of the tabernacle and it being an old song? Is it just about faithfulness? No, it's not just about the faithfulness of God. It's about that God's justice and his deliverance, God's justice and his deliverance is dependent upon Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's plans. Basically, what I want you to get from this and walk away from this is, 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 is that there's nothing in the world, nothing in this world that will bring justice and deliverance to your life except for Jesus. And so let's look at the first one, talking about justice. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's justice. Revelation talks about justice and he talks about uh, how that God is going to make everything right. Now, we all have definitions of justice, right? Um, media and, and, and Hollywood and everywhere else has got definitions of justice. What does it look like? Well, in the Bible, justice basically means this, righteousness. It means to be right, to make things right, to make things righteous. There are a lot of things wrong in this world and we want them to be right. There are a lot of things that I would like to see that are right in this world, but they're right in my eyes. Why, can, why, can, why is it only Jesus can make things right and exercise justice and judgment? It's because my judgment is foggy. Let's give an example. If I were to judge myself on my sin, I would want mercy and grace. That's the justice I want. God, you exercise justice in my life. I've sinned, forgive me. Now, somebody we don't like, somebody does something wrong to us, the justice changes, doesn't it? Get them, kill them. <laughs> you see, we're not capable of exercising good justice and judgment. Why? Because we are selfish and biased and we really love our own. And so our justice is foggy. But when we come to Jesus, there are two phrases that kind of declare the justice of Christ and how that when he came to die on the cross and he died on the cross for the sins of the world, he offered his mercy. But if you reject his mercy, the only thing left is his wrath. So there, it, Jesus, it, it's Jesus is the fulfillment of that. So it's what you do with Jesus determines the end of that. And we've preached about it over and over and over. And I think we should be reminded. But if you're here for the first time or you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've never trusted him, this is the moment where you can consider this. Where Jesus is the fulfillment of God's justice. Now, when we talk about God's justice and we wonder, many people say, well, I, I don't know if God can do that. Will he exercise justice? Well, in verse number 17 of chapter 16, there's a phrase. It says, and the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. So we're talking about the justice of God. There, there are times in life where we say, well, justice is not being served. And we would blame society, we would blame politics, we would blame uh, uh, leaders, we would blame the church. Sometimes we blame people in our own families. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to find justice and you wonder, is justice really gonna be served in this world? Well, we come to this passage and the Bible says it is done. That term in the Greek literally means this, it means it's gonna happen. Not only is it going to happen, but it is happening. If you read it in our Southern language, let's try to read it. It says, 
And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple and from the throne saying, hey, y'all watch this. (laughs) That's what he's saying. Watch this. It means that God is actually going to do it. It's going to happen. The wrath of God is going to happen. The grace of God is going to happen. The, the, the mercy of God, the judgment of God, the justice of God, it's all going to happen. As a matter of fact, it is happening. And so there is coming a day when we talk about the justice of God that Jesus did all of the work on the cross and he rose again on the third day and now seated on the throne that he has the power to exercise, it's going to happen. Second word that we see here is in verse number one of chapter 15, back up to that. And it says, then when I saw, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last for with them, the wrath of God is finished. All right, so chapter 16, verse 17 says it is done. Well, chapter 15, verse one says it is finished. It's finished. So it seems like it's the same word, but this is a different word. It it is the same word that was used when Jesus was on the cross. It is finished in the Greek. It is finished. It's the same words that is used in Philippians chapter one, verse number six, about the people of God, where God says, I will complete the work in you that I have started. It is finished. It is the illusion or part of the same word in the Hebrew when you go back all the way to the beginning where he says it is good in the first day and it was good and the second day and it was good. He, he is saying the same thing. So whatever he's saying at creation and at the death of Jesus and in your life as you live for him, he's saying in the end, it is finished. It's going to happen. And here's what it means. It means this, that it will be complete. It will be perfect. That's why we trust the judgment of God and the justice of God, because it's right. Creation was right when he made it. Jesus was right when he died. And we are right with God when we, when we are completed by him. And everything in the judgment for the future is right when God does it. It's right. It means this, it's complete. Don't touch it. I love that. There are a lot of things that we do in our lives. We're like, hey, 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 don't touch that. Don't touch it. I got it. It's good. But Jesus will do a work that is so powerful in the end. And as he's doing it, it is a perfect work. So what do we do with that? It's almost like we're going to have to trust the Lord with how he runs his business. And just say, God, I know that I'm not seeing justice and I'm not seeing what you're, what you're talking about. We go back to the first century and the context of what they were doing when they were, when they were sitting there reading, hearing this being read to them. They were actually, they were actually in a moment being persecuted and, 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 and being frustrated and couldn't get jobs and, and they were distraught. But yet John comes with a word and says, hey, trust him with how he's doing his business. He knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. So it comes to this that we don't know what we're doing. God knows what he's doing. And it comes from the fact that we deserve it. We deserve it, don't we? I I, I don't know if you feel like they deserve the wrath of God, but we actually do. It was one time, um, it was probably several times, but one time in particular that I remember, uh, I was sending a text to my wife And I had just gotten done uh, a little bit before with a guy that was at our church and he was was, uh, doing some IT work. And we were trying to change systems and things like that. And so he left and and, uh, so I had called him prior and I don't know how in the world I did this, but then I I, I just texted my wife and and I really, I felt like at the moment, I was like, you know, I want to tell my wife how much I love her. I mean, it was PG, but it was, I just tell her how much I loved her. (laughs) And so I get a text back from the IT guy says, I love you too. (laughs) I couldn't take it back. I'd already sent it. So I just copied, pasted it and sent it to my wife. (laughs) Uh, We didn't hire him. But I, I, 
it, it, I had this idea, this thought of, of, I couldn't take it back. I'd already seen it. It's already gone. And that, that is exactly what happened in the very beginning. We sent a message to God that we didn't need him. And it's already gone. And now we're going to have to, we're going to have to find the way to make it right. And that can only be done through Jesus. He paid the price. Somebody's got to pay. We've already sent that message to God and somebody's got to pay the price for saying no to God. And it's not us, it's Jesus. So the second thing, and this is, this is uh, just two points to this passage that I think are, we, we want to really find hope in. I know that we're talking about the wrath of God, not much hope with that. But what actually is happening in this text is it's not that God is trying to kill things. I, I think I said it last week that God is not, he's not trying to make things worse or trying to, he's not just, just mad at people, mad at evil and trying to, he's actually wanting to purify. He wants to purify the world for his people. So when he's purifying the world for his people, there is some judgment that has to take place. There's some wrath that has to take place because the world is so bad. And so when we look at these passages, the reason why it's celebratory is because it's a celebration of deliverance. He's delivering his people. Now, when you're sitting there and you really think through deliverance, you're, you're really thinking that, well, what are we delivered from? And, and this is the question I want to ask. And I think, I think we all need to chew on. You ever chewed on thoughts? But chew on this one as you go on through your week. This question. If we're talking about Jesus delivering us, do you feel like that you need to be delivered? Is the world so good to you? that you don't need to be delivered from it. Just chew on that for a while. Because for me, I do love the world. I, 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 like, I like me, I'm part of the world, I like me. I like, I like the things that we've got. I, I really like being part of this world. But there is a sense within me, there is a sense within me that I need delivered. I need deliverance from myself from the temptations, from my attitude. I need deliverance from the decisions that I might make. Young people, you, you, students, you, you need deliverance from making dumb choices early. We need deliverance from uh, older ones. We need deliverance from mourning over the decisions we've already made when it was early. We need deliverance from politics. I didn't think I'd get an amen out of that. <laughs> we need deliverance from the wickedness of the world, the evil. We need deliverance from people who are evil. We need to be delivered. Now, when we talk about deliverance in the text, what we're talking about is there is coming a day in which Jesus is going to deliver us from all of those things. He's gonna deliver me from temptation. He's gonna deliver me from the guilt. He's gonna deliver me from all of the things that would hinder me and bother me. He's gonna deliver me from those to something else. You see, when God delivers, he doesn't just deliver you out of, but he delivers you into. And so he's trying to deliver us out of our nasty and deliver us into something that is purified, that is good, that, that, that really can't mess us up again. And so they, we're celebrating because Revelation is telling those people and telling us that we have a day coming. Listen to this. We have a day coming where we will not be hindered by the things that hinder us in this world any longer. I'm glad for that. I am so glad. Even delivered from myself. So when we read in chapter 15 and he talks about those, he goes to chapter 16 and he kind of goes into, and I don't have the scripture up there, I just want to uh, briefly go through it, but it's, it's a, a mirror of the plagues of Egypt, kind of. First angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and his harmful, painful sores. 
Second angel poured out his bowl and became blood of, and uh, the, the sea became blood and poured out the third angel, river, rivers and springs became blood and it continues on, fourth angel, fifth angel, all of these things and, and all of these bowls being poured out. It's not like a third of the earth was destroyed, a third of the, bl- the blood, uh, uh, the sea was, no, it's all of it. God's like, it's done. It is done. This is happening. This is happening. And it's going to be right. And so if this is happening and it's going to be right, he's not only going to be right in his justice, but he's going to be right in his deliverance. Now, I don't know if you are wondering why God is not doing certain things in your life. Why he's not delivering, why he's not... Just again, trust him with how he's running his business because his way is right. And there is coming a day where he says, it's going to be finished right. So what would that mean for us? That would mean for us several things that we are, we, I've got great hope in the future. I can look back and see how God's been faithful in the past and, ha- and know that he's going to be faithful in the future. But right now, what does that do for me now? It means that if I can trust God for my past and I can trust God for my future, I can trust God right now. I can trust God to find me a partner. Students, trust God for the right person to marry. I can trust God that if I don't have anybody, I'll be good single. I can trust God that if someone in my family that I love goes home to be with the Lord, that he's going to take care of me. I got, I, 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 just even what we talked about last week, that if I take my last breath, that I can trust God in his deliverance. Everything, we can trust God. So what's our reaction when we talk about trusting God? There are reactions in the text that go beyond that trust part or even complement it and go with it. And there were two reactions one reaction in the text is that when the wrath of God was poured out, they did not repent. In verse number 11, it says that, that they did not repent. I don't know about you, but I've been thinking, and I, I may have said it in one of the sermons, because I, I just can't get past it. I mean, I've been thinking that you would think that if God would do all that, and they recognized it because they called him God. They did not repent and called him God. But they, if he does all that, why would they not just go ahead and bow? We would think the same thing that if they're not going to bow then, they don't bow now, right? There's a lot of people, I don't know why they don't trust Jesus. They just don't bow. But you may be here this morning and you've never bowed to Christ. But the spirit of God is speaking to you at this moment and inviting you into the family. I think that's the difference where you know something is happening in your life where you've, it's almost like God's speaking to you. And he's asking you to repent of your sins and convicting you and saying, you know what, the life that you're living right now is not the life you should have. You're trusting in something else. You need to trust in me. That, that's one thing that we should do. And, and it boils down to this. It boils down to Pride. I'm going to do it my way. That's where sin has, it began and it has always been is pride. I want to do it my way. And here's what the text is kind of asking of all of us or showing all of us is there is coming a day where pride will find the wrath of God. But God wants to deliver you. Drop the pride and repent. Second thing that he shows the second reaction is in verse 15. It's an it's a interesting way in which he describes it, but it, nonetheless, it, it works. He said in verse 15, of all of that you've seen, behold, I am coming like a thief. Jesus says, you don't know when I'm coming, but blessed is the one who stays awake. It means being prepared, watchful, staying awake keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. That's an interesting way of putting that, right? But it is, we get the point. You get the point that God is, that Jesus is saying to all of his people, don't be lazy. Don't be prideful, but don't be lazy. That was the church at Laodicea in chapter three where Jesus said to that church, 
you are apathetic and you need to repent. You see, it's not, we don't, we're not fully delivered yet. God has delivered us from our sins. He has forgiven us. He's given us a new life and he's given us the ability. Young people, students, parents, senior adults, he has given you new life. What do you want to do with that new life until the full deliverance comes? <clears throat> until that full deliverance comes, he wants to give you new life so that you can use it for his glory. That's why that we have connections and that's why that we have conversations is so that people may know the savior that we know so that they can repent and not find the wrath of God. See, God has given us that ability and we can't be lazy with it. Life now is not to be lived for ourselves. It's not to be lived selfishly. It's to be lived so that others may know him. We're here this morning to celebrate the life of other people and to give glory to God. And so don't be prideful and don't be lazy. So if you are prideful and if you are lazy, Someone who's not a follower of Christ, I want you to come and, and you can talk to me or any of the pastors that are going to be here. We will find somebody next to you and say, hey, I want to know Jesus as my savior. They will take you somewhere to find out how to know Christ. But it's this, if you admit that you're a sinner and you trust Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, give him your life and say, God, forgive me of my sins. I want you to be my Lord. For those of you who are our followers of Christ, start at a young age. But if you are older, say, God, help me trust you in how you do your business and wake me up where I'm asleep. Heavenly Father, we are grateful this morning for your word. God, I pray that you would help us and wake us up. And there's so many things that I do need deliverance from because of my own flesh. Lord, my pride gets in the way so much. God, help us all to trust you and wake us up. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand and would you...